Welcome back to DBD TV, the spin-off of Dragon Ball Dissection where I discuss the animated adaptation of Toriyama Akira's Dragon Ball manga. If you're looking for my 8-part review and analysis of the Saiyan arc, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. But I highly recommend you check it out since major story points won't be covered here. This is all about that wonderful happy phenomenon known as filler. And welcome also to our first stop of the 5th annual Dragon Ball Dissection December. My yearly Dragon Ball Dissection Marathon where I put out a new episode once a week for the entire month of December. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and make the assumption that this is going to be one of the easiest Dragon Ball Dissection scripts I've ever had to write. I pretty much know the entire animated Saiyan arc by heart. There is literally no other part of the anime I know as vividly as this. I don't think I would even need to refresh myself on the material because I already know exactly what I want to talk about. Like so many American fans, it was my introduction to the franchise. I recorded every episode off of the TV, and of course I had to endure how many times they were rerun before the American Season 3 was released. Years later, when I was an adult, it was the first, and for a time, only Dragon Box to be released, so once again, I watched those episodes more than subsequent ones. The Cyan arc is what got me into this series, and based on the fact I gave the manga Cyan arc the 9 score, it's no secret that I find it one of the high watermarks of the series. But as I mentioned last time I covered this arc, it also makes me keenly aware of the possibility of nostalgia bias creeping in. You always remember your first, after all. And of course, I lay awake at night, tossing and turning in cold sweats, wondering if I gave the Cyan arc a 9 instead of a 10 just to throw you off the trail, just to make it seem like I'm being objective, but in reality, I'm in denial about pushing my pro Cyan agenda on all of you! In all seriousness, I am the product of my experiences, and it's impossible to know for sure what affects me and why. But I feel I've done the best I can over the years to examine and re-examine all of my opinions of Dragon Ball, to give each arc its fair shake. There are elements I'm plenty nostalgic for that I've been highly critical of in Dragon Ball Dissection, and the opposite has been true as well. And I don't think it's any different with the Saiyan arc, but I feel it's only fair to bring it up. So last we left the powers that be in the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai arc, Toriyama's editor Torishima Kazuhiko had asked for a change in some key positions of the anime staff, and so Morishita Kozo and Koyama Takao were brought on board in time for that story arc. But that wasn't the end of the changes to come. Now, two years ago when I covered this arc before, I stated that there had never been an official source explaining why the TV series split the manga into two parts. All we had was Toriyama confirming that while he did come up with the name Dragon Ball Z at the request of Toei Animation, he felt the name of the series was fine the way it was and never did change the name of his own work from just Dragon Ball. And again, let me stress for all of you who might be new, there is no Dragon Ball Z manga, just like there's no Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 novel. The manga is just one series. But in the interim between the manga Cyan arc videos and this one came the Forbes interview with Torishima I discussed last time. The new anime producer also was very smart and said that if we had a new title in that Dragon Ball would finish and we'd start a new show, then that meant the anime would get more money for promotion. So there you have it. Dragon Ball Z came into existence not for any story or tonal reasons, but because of marketing. Since Kozo had come on board for the 23rd Budokai arc, that obviously meant his idea of relaunching as a new series wouldn't have been explored until then, making the Cyan arc the first clean dividing point to do so. Which I guess means that this is now DBD's... Z... DB... No, DBZ... D... T... You know what, never mind. This is just getting too complicated. I had no idea the English language had so many letters that ended in an E sound, but apparently I have the monopoly on them in this title. So, while Dragon Ball Z was just a marketing stunt, continued adapting a manga that was just one series, and was helmed by largely the same staff that had made the previous show, that doesn't mean that there weren't any actual changes between the two. Most obviously, with the new branding came a new theme song, the iconic Chala Head Chala, which is so well known that I dare say even most American fans have some familiarity with it, despite it rarely making its way across to our shores for adaptations. The song was performed by Kagayama Hironobu, who would become the voice of Dragon Ball songs for years to come. He performed both of Dragon Ball Z's opening themes, one of the ending themes, themes for specials, themes for movies, themes for CDs, themes for video games, and it all started here. Speaking of music, Kikuchi Shunsuke remains the composer and a lot of his tracks carry over into this new series, but this is one of the last times there's a huge push for new series music. 
As I've said while covering the movies, while the series will continue to receive regular infusions of new music, most of it in the Z era comes from the movies. For example, by the time Nappa and Vegeta land, the series is using music from the first Z movie. And hey, with the exception of 1989, that's two new movies a year, so that's nothing to sneeze at. But at the very beginning, there are a lot of new action themes, music based around Chala Head Chala, and quite a few character themes. There's a Saiyan theme and a Vegeta theme, and several variations of a cute little upbeat theme for Gohan. Z also introduced episode recaps having their own dedicated piece of music. The next episode previews always had that, but in the first series, the recap would just use existing music from the rest of the score. From this point on though, all Dragon Ball animation would use a specific piece of music just for recaps, based on a main theme song. What else, well, technically didn't start, but really took off here, were the episode titles. You know what I'm talking about. It's that formula of describing episode, follow-up sentence to expound on first sentence. The first Dragon Ball TV series mostly had short to the point episode titles. A few two-part titles cropped up here and there, but they definitely became more prevalent in the 23rd Budokai, and then once Z hit, they became the standard. I think I can count the episodes from this point on that don't follow the formula on one hand, and I'm pretty sure they're all from early episodes. But it's endured through Z, GT, Kai, and now Super, not to mention nearly all the original Dragon Ball Z movies. Finally, as I mentioned in the 21st Budokai arc, I don't really focus on manga to anime color changes, like whatever the heck is up with carding. That's partly because Toriyama's not terribly consistent himself, but it's also because I'm colorblind and often don't notice them. But I have always noticed that the shift to Z did give the anime staff an opportunity to nudge at least one ubiquitous element closer to its manga counterpart. The TV show had always presented the Kame uniform as red with a black belt and yellow patches. And when Goku presented his modified version of the outfit, the undershirt was likewise black, although strangely enough, the end credits color had blue. But starting here, reds become oranges, blacks become blues, and yellows become whites, similar to how it was always colored in the manga, so good on them. Then again, this is also the arc that introduces Vegeta, and everyone knows about that little snafu, where he has green armor and red hair in his first couple of appearances before arriving on Earth in his more traditional color scheme. Nappa changes to a lesser extent, having the same brown armor accents as Raditz, which become yellow when he reaches Earth. With all of that out of the way, let's get to it. Doragon Boru Zetto, or Dragon Ball Z, premiered on April 26, 1989, while Kuririn, Piccolo, and Gohan are defending against Nappa in the manga. The Saiyan arc is a notable entry in the TV adaptations in that I think it might have been the most concentrated amount of original filler material. See, I mentioned last time that Torishima asked for a change in staff, because he thought the producer at the time was treating the material too comedically. And I still don't see it that way. Personally, I wonder if the answer isn't in his comments about wanting to keep a tighter leash on the series. While the Dragon Ball adaptations as a whole are extremely faithful, most times recreating panels one-to-one, -one, I do feel the first TV series takes more liberties than the second. Look at the Piccolo arc that Torishima complains about. I even mentioned in that DBD TV episode how difficult it was for me to watch the series while following along in the manga due to things like scenes being shifted around, and scenes being combined with other scenes. There are very few instances in Dragon Ball Z of major plot points being rewritten so heavily, a la the Choshinsui quest. I'd say the largest change here is flipping the order of Gohan's transformation scene with Chi-Chi's scene at Kame House, so that the former takes place on the following night. That leaves the original night open for a hilariously awkward scene of Kuririn visiting the Son home and utterly failing to deliver the bad news. So while it's odd, given that supposition, that ten solid episodes of this arc would be filler, it's really not much that significantly steps on the toes of Toriyama's material. Don't get me wrong, most of it is well integrated, but there is a reason people say a manga edit of Dragon Ball, a la Dragon Ball Kai for Dragon Ball Z, would be a much more difficult task to accomplish. But I really like this content. As I said when I covered the Saiyan arc before, and maybe it's nostalgia talking, the arc feels like it's missing something without that huge chunk of filler between the Raditz fight and the fight with Nappa and Vegeta. The middle of the manga version has always felt rushed to me, specifically in regards to how it handles Gohan. Remember, he is introduced as a mini Goku, but in looks only. His personality is in stark contrast to his father. While I find the pace of episode 1 to be ridiculously slow in setting up the plot points of this story arc by spending most of its runtime showing Gohan screw around in the woods, 
hey, another example of the anime introducing characters before they show up in the manga. It is an intentional callback to filler in the first episode of the previous TV series. In it, Goku makes sport of an aggressive saber tiger, having the time of his life doing so. Gohan, well, doesn't. Like various aspects of the manga, this serves to contrast the two characters. So it always annoyed me that Toriyama would set up a difficulty for Gohan to overcome, only to skip ahead six months after it's largely been solved. But this added material in the middle of the arc, which mostly focuses on Gohan, shows his struggle and development step by step and allows us to get to know him that much better. There are even a couple of really strong downer endings, which Dragon Ball doesn't typically do. Gohan loses his robot friend, he fails to stop his pet dinosaur from getting eaten, and he's forced to abandon his orphan friends to the authorities in the hope that they'll ultimately have better lives. They really tug at the heartstrings. But whether he's reacting to the loss of his tail, trying to save others from perceived injustices, teaching himself how to patch up his own wounds, forage for food, or even escape from his training, they all feel like important steps to prepare Gohan for what's to come. And they culminate in Gohan making it all the way home, but returning to Piccolo, accepting his responsibility rather than having it forced on him. His journey is just so much more palpable here than it is in the manga, and I didn't even know for years that these episodes were something some other fans took issue with. Some say it's negated by the fact that even after all of that, he still panics when confronted by Nappa, so this material is at complete odds with the real story. I don't know. Maybe if I'd read the manga first, I'd feel the same way, but I just don't agree. It always made sense to me. Gohan's been through a lot, but I'd say there's a world of difference between becoming self-sufficient to witnessing the adults around him being blown up and dismembered. So I can totally buy that he'd be able to be self-sufficient in the wild, but still freak out when being confronted by the realities of a battle this intense. Speaking of Gohan making it home, the TV Cyan arc introduces an issue regarding that. Since the TV series opens with the domestic life of Goku and his family, it raises the question of, where does Goku live anyway? If you remember, at the very beginning, he lives in the tiny house he shared with his grandfather. In the second arc, he returns there to get his stuff, and that's it. We never see Goku return to that house again. In the manga Saiyan arc, we're introduced to Goku, Gohan, and Chi-Chi at Kame House. They go straight into a hospital after that, and then space after that. We don't really see them at home. So, what's the anime to do? Just make up a home! And the idea is one I like quite a bit. They establish in the first episode that it's a larger home built right next to the house Goku grew up in for a cute connection to his roots. The house is something of a combination of old-style and capsule-style architecture. And in the episode with the orphans, it's established that it's located on Mount Paozu. Paozu is a type of Chinese steamed bun, and is the same name as the old lady in Oolong's village who gives Goku and Bluma a Dragon Ball. So this TV-exclusive homestead sticks around for a while, including the first several Dragon Ball Z movies. But as I stated in the late Frieza arc, there's a brief scene with Chi-Chi and Guma o where we finally do see Goku's home, which becomes more prominent in the Cell arc and beyond, and, as expected, it looks totally different and is in a completely different location. So, once the anime gets to the Cell arc, their house is never seen or mentioned again, nor is Mount Paozu. Although, that doesn't keep people from using the name to this day, much to my chagrin. You know what also brings out the chagrin in me? Not being able to finish a DVD TV arc in a single episode. But that just means there's much more to talk about. Check back a week from today for the conclusion to the Cyan arc. See you there! We've got quite a month ahead, so make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. If this is your first Dragon Ball Dissection exposure, check out the link to the full playlist.